very honored tonight to have with us uh, Richard Solwerman, who is uh, our distinguished professor of the practice in our college, and he's the curator of this uh, series of uh, conversations that have been going on during this uh, semester. Uh, Richard Solwerman is uh, an architect, a designer. Uh, he's also a... Yeah, yeah, it's true. Can we, can we, can we, can we can sing. We can sing. I was saying that uh, Richard Solwerman, in addition to um, his work as a designer, he's been a great communicator. He's the creator of uh, the TED conferences uh, series. And for us, it's really a privilege to have him among our faculty this, uh, this year. And of course, we have also with us President Joseph Aoun, who, in addition to being the seventh president of Northeastern University, is also a leading voice in the debate on uh, education, on higher education, at a global scale. And I just want to mention that uh, he's been recently elected to be the chair of the American Council on Education. So uh, I think that the subject of education uh, tonight is going to be one of the uh, areas to be touched. But with uh, Richard, we never know what the conversation is going to be. <laughs> so thank you so much to the two of you for uh, being here, and thank you to everyone. Can somebody who's standing over there sit down in this empty chair? It seems strange to look at this empty chair. Somebody. Some old person. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I really love conversations, and uh, I, I believe that uh, people fall in love and stay in love, not because of sex, but because of conversation, because of the ability to have a conversation with another human being. I think it's so fundamental to most of our lives, the ability to have this nodding head when you talk to somebody and they nod, you know they understand what you're saying or they go along with it. There's a certain trust. There's a gap because we haven't invented a computer to nod. <laughs> uh, we don't really know how we're, whether we interact with it or not. There's not that humanity about it. And I can fantasize of Watson and Crick talking about what they were doing, having a conversation, even if they didn't like each other, having a conversation when they created something, building on each other's ideas or objecting to each other's ideas. Uh, it's remarkable out here. Uh, Nathan came in, somebody I've known for a long time. The dean came down and saw me and they cooked up this thing that I should come here three times for, uh, for three years, and I'm, so that my first year. Your trial is over tonight, and um, uh, so uh, this is important that uh, I, and they didn't ask me to invite him, uh, and in fact, they said, why did I was inviting the president, because I, the last two times I had somebody I knew from Woods Hole, a good old friend, and Moshe Zapti, the architect, another good old friend, Dave Gallo. but I thought, I'm here, I should uh, try it out twice and then see what the boss thinks. And, uh, and sort of celebrate this notion of conversation. So we had a conversation earlier today, just before we came here. Uh, he wanted to do it, I didn't want to do it. Uh, uh, but he wanted to do it, I, I think, to, as a feeling out process that goes beyond the listings in Google seeing what somebody might be like and, in a sense, testing my reaction to his wit and back and forth. And it was, it was wonderful. We had a good time. We had almost like a schoolgirl. And I enjoyed it. Yeah, I, me I too. enjoyed it. And, and we had pistachio nuts and quite good ones. Too. Um, and, uh, That's our dinner. <laughs> Well, it's my dinner. It's probably not your dinner. No, I, don't I, don't, I heard you make plans. Yeah. So, one of the things we discussed was, uh, an 
and we disagree. <coughs> so I thought we would bring it up again. As I said, and it might be semantics that, uh, first of all, I believe in the word learning, not education. I know he's just got no a position as head of an educational group. That's what they call uh, teachers in cover. They call the words about what most lot of people must really do. It's called education. And I believe in learning, and he believes in that too. Uh, in this idea of from the bottom up rather than an education which is from the top down. It should be a board of learning, not a board of education. He believes in that. But I said that part of uh, the task of people who call themselves uh, educators or teachers or professors uh, should be as guides, not as uh, teachers. And part of the task was to give permission uh, and it's the word, that's the word that we, we took on with. We give people permission, we give everybody permission to have curiosity and to learn about different things. Mm -hmm. And he took umbrage with that word. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let me tell you why I diverged about the word permission. We, as educators, do not give permission. If we give permission, we're already failing. <coughs> The learner is giving herself permission. That's my wife, she's emotional. About what you said. She thinks I'm picking on her. Yeah, absolutely. And it's only the beginning. <laughs> so if you, if you position yourself as giving permission to the learner, that means that you are possessing something there and you're not and you are the holder of this knowledge but in fact the learner doesn't need your permission doesn't need mine the learner simply takes it wherever she finds it and a step further if you look at various societies historically and synchronically maybe nowadays you see and we talked a little bit about that but you see a big difference i live in three continents and I faced three different educational systems. And when I came to the United States to study, no one gave me permission. In every other place, people gave me permission to learn. Whereas here, people didn't give me permission to learn. They said, it's up to you to form your own journey, to form your own path, and then step further. They welcome the fact that I challenge them and they welcome the fact that they were challenging me in this process. So this is why, having lived in three systems, I believe that we don't give permission. We don't have the authority to give permission. The learners are grabbing it. Let me also, as a footnote, mentioned that I just finished my term as the chair of the American Council on Education. I'm not beginning as the dean said. That's a small problem. So he was mentioning the end of something, not the beginning of something. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I'm on the, the board, etc. But, yeah. but I chaired that and I finished last spring. You just parenthetically were just given some other award though, because when I was Googling you I saw you just got something. What was that? Yeah, if you talk about mine, I'll talk about yours. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay. You told me not to mention it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I also told you not to wear a tie. Look at this. I left it in my pocket. Where is it? You took it from I me. I took it. I'll take this off. <laughs> um, I think it's semantical difference because uh, you heard what he's saying, and it's semantical. What I mean is basically also what he's saying, except that I believe as we, as we live at home and as we go to school, we are not given that permission. We are specifically not given that permission to release, to be interested in everything. In fact, many times, many of our questions are quashed. And so I'll get to the next little mantra that I will say, and that is, I have a definition of learning 
and it's that learning is remembering what you're interested in. Um, I also have another mantra which says public information should be made public. And by public, I mean available, understandable, accessible, and free. Those both seem like they're benign because you can't fault public information from being made public. And I believe learning is remembering what you're interested in from my experience and from throwing it out to people for 30 or 40 years of my life saying, do they not remember even courses they didn't do well in? And do they forget the courses that they might have done well and they weren't interested in? If that is true, the idea that we tap people's interests and we give them the ability to find their journey, that really changes curricula. And it changes how you find your way in this journey through a university, through a school in a university, through life. You, you like Plato. You are cautious like Plato's approach. You know, Plato, we Socrates. We will remember, we remember there is a world of uh, ideas and a world of interest, and we remember that. You see, I think we can go a step further. Learning is not a passive operation, because remembering is a cognitive operation. It's a passive operation. Whereas what is, for instance, of great interest to me is that learning is experiential. Namely, in order to learn, you integrate you know, what you are thinking about, what you are discovering, and you are also bringing the real world experience and integrating it into this process. And that's, for instance, what we do here at Northeast. And we said, in order to learn, you need to integrate your, the classroom experience or whatever experience you have that is cognitive with the experience you have that is in the real world and bring them together. So I don't take the view that it's a remembrance. I take the view that it's a process of discovery, of sharpening. I didn't remember nanotechnology, but I discovered nanotechnology by learning about it through my colleagues, with my colleagues, etc. So for me, it's much more, to quote one of our colleagues here, uh, is learning, thinking, and doing. And I like this dimension of bringing the two together. I, my, my wife is back. Be nice to me now. She <laughs> <laughs> can me back the water. Can you give it some water? No, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Um, well, my, my uh, Emo Phillips, who was a funny cartoon, a, a friendly comedian from years ago, had this one joke that I repeat that I love. He said, for years and years and years, he thought his brain was the most important organ of his body. Until one day he thought, hmm, look who's telling me that. <laughs> um, and I, I think of what my brain is telling me now, and it's without memory, I and mean, that's why I gave it such a big position, without memory I feel like I'm nothing, and that's why the fear as you get older of the loss of memory is so fundamental. I agree. This part is different from what you told me before. But the memory, I know the memory is only, the synapse has only happened for me. And I, the only person I know is me. We talked about that. The only person you know is you. Uh, the synapses seem to be only agitated with my interest. Uh, my interest in a subject and I'm trying to connect that interest to another interest. And what I look for in a teacher is a guide to help me with those connections, much as uh, Wukong said all, all, all the decoration or everything happens at the joint. Those joining things, those moments of connection seem to be, it seems like we should celebrate. So the connections as we talk now are the celebration, if we can visualize them, of moving on to the next next piece. That's why memory is so important to me. 
I, that part I completely agree. But knowledge is not remembrance only. That's what I was modifying in you know, the, the statement. That's why I looked at it slightly different. It is an action of discovery, of shaping, of going beyond remembrance. That in there is something they know, new, new. You know that. You know, and we, over the years, that's the meaning of discovery. And the discovery can be a discovery that is personal, then a discovery that is impacting others. And I agree with you about the role of the teacher. The teacher is a catalyst. But learning is not restricted to the teaching process, as we agree. You know, you can learn it. Learning is ubiquitous. <coughs> Talking to you before and now, I'm learning about you in the same way that you you know, a, every person in this audience is trying to learn more about you, about me, and about our thinking in these matters. So we are not remembering us, they are discovering us. You grew up in, or you lived and worked in four continents? Three. Three. Do you, you know something? I don't know. You think that the next job is going to be there? You want me to move to the fourth? I, I didn't listen to all that. <laughs> I said corrected. Uh, one of the things you tell me when I sat in your office is how different people, not your office, in your meeting room, uh, he has a rather elaborate, for those who haven't seen it, rather ostentatious, elaborate <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, meeting room. I was very and impressed. I made mean, sure before he left that he didn't take the furniture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you made a point, and it was a very good point, of how various groups come in and where people sit. That's a fascinating point. Uh, and uh, how does, can you describe what that means as far as a society goes, of where people sit? I think it's interesting that people are sitting here in the front row. I think it's interesting you still save seats for people, which I don't agree with. But, uh, um, because many places I speak, uh, not at TED, TED, there was a rush for the front rows. But most places I speak, the two first rows people come in, students and others come in, and they'll sit further back, they're like they're afraid of the first rows of the classroom. I find it a strange, strange thing of where people sit and how a room is arranged and how somebody designed this room to be this way and how it modifies where we're sitting and where that is and often if there's a podium, not a podium, a lectern that's over to one side rather than symmetrical. These seem like details but they're fundamental ways we think of how we talk to each other. How far we would have a different conversation if this table wasn't here and we were closer, which is the way it should be. No, that's over, that's more. Go, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Give it to me. <laughs> I'll take the water. I'll come to you. So we were very close over there in my office. Yes, that's better. Yeah. No, this little thing makes a difference. It might seem like trivia. So what, but not in fact, a lot of our conversation might seem like trivia. But the teacher, we get the, the distance with the audience. Huh? With the first row. We should remove the table altogether. Yeah, we, we don't have the time for that. <laughs> I wouldn't have the table here at all. And there's a real difference in how you communicate with another person when you're sitting this close. As you know, they've done tests in libraries. If the librarian has you check out, or you, they touch your hand, there's a memory pass that people remember what they're doing better. And there's a whole different feeling about the relationship with people depending on the, that proximity. I'm not trying to be pseudoscience here. But I know from years of watching people on stage, how much things change where people sit and how they talk. So, tell me your experience of people in your in your in your office and in different okay. countries. So, it's what's interesting is that <clears throat> you, I was mentioning to Richard that you know traveling to various countries uh, and lecturing there in various settings. For instance, we were in the front row. We had in some countries the full professors. 
then in the second row, the associate professors, in the third row, <laughs> the, you know, the assistant professors, then you had the students. And what is interesting is that people <coughs> didn't feel that they had permission to speak. And, you know, when the professor recognized the associate professor or the student, then she could ask a question, not before. And this is why I was mentioning in the United States, the system is completely different. And the fact that, you know, no one here is asking for permission, you know, to speak, to ask question, to question, more important. Imagine the question. At some point, let me give you an example. I have a <coughs> Uh, somebody whom I knew in uh, Korea who was telling me, remember some of us who were uh, old, who are older than others, Korea had a big, you know, problem with uh, their fleet, their pilots were crashing constantly. And at some point, you know, they tried to understand why. They came, their pilots came from the military. Very accomplished, first rate. But the co-pilot, they discovered, never questioned the pilot, even when the pilot made a mistake. So they changed the system completely to retrain them to question. So that's why I was questioning the idea that we, we give permission to people to learn. We don't. We don't. And I agree with you, we facilitators at best. So what I like about <coughs> our system of learning is that it's not only we, we are the catalyst at best, and but also we can be questioned by the learners who are around us, and that's why we further our knowledge and they further theirs. So there is a like constant dialect. You know, in many other places, question the professor you work with is a norm. Whereas here we celebrate that. We, we celebrate the fact that they, you know, maybe a beginner in every field can move further than you. I've been working in this field for 20 years. That's precious. So that's why I was mentioning that movie. I said to you when I came in, uh, that I've been observing various educational groups. There's a group in Columbia that's for future learning or something. There's a group here that's on that. There's a group here. And, it, and I said, at best, it seems like they're doing, uh, this is a gross simplification, uh, a better version of what people have done before, but electronically. That uh, what they've added to uh, these big movements in the United States is an electronic version of what they've done before. What I see here is the beginning, and I, just the beginning of a an attempt to break out of the mold of just doing a better version of what's been done before. Where do you think it could it could possibly go in five years? Look, first of all, five years is an important Ivor milestone. Five, five, five. Yes, <laughs> five years. And you know, at some point, everybody got excited about putting everything online, mm -hmm. and then they, you know. There is a realization now <coughs> that this was a good move, but it's not enough. Why isn't it enough? Because people started saying, we need a hybrid model. What does the hybrid model mean? It means that we need this interaction. I need to be next to you. You don't want the table. You don't want the screen between us. Mm -hmm. So and they came to this realization very recently the last maybe five months by right? saying no, not pure online model would not work. Uh, we need a hybrid model. And they were led to that because the results, you know, the goodness model, graduation, uh, etc., etc., etc. So if you look beyond that, all these are tools that are serving the learner. But what's important is that we're moving to a situation five years from now where customization is going to be essential in many ways. You learn presumably differently from what I learned. Susan Ambrose, who was a colleague, 
spends a lot of time. Is she here today? Okay. Hi, Susan. So, you know, you do the interview her rather than interviewing me. She's paying attention to I've seen her nod. Uh -huh. <laughs> I look at all of you, at least that side of me. Yeah. And so they, you know, Susan is a specialist of learning, and she's spending a, a lot of time looking at learning models. But learning models are not abstract models, are how people learn. And if you tell me what's going to happen five years from now, is, is customization is going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be everywhere. And which means that I'm going to approach learning differently from yours, and therefore I will have the opportunity to do it. Some people are, you know, let me be very simplistic. Some people are more tactile. Some people are less. Some people learn by doing. Some people want to study it and then do it. And this is very simplistic as it is. But so if you tell me where the future will be, it's customization, personalization. And if you think about it, the personalization is in education is really what's happening in almost everything. We talked about medicine. What's happening in medicine? I'm the same thing. Personalization. You know, personalized medicine. Everybody's talking about that. So we are moving to a situation where learning is going to be for you, with you, and not imposed on you because I created the curriculum over the years and I think that this is the best way for you to approach it. So it's, we're moving from a teacher-centered approach from a learner, to a learner-centered approach, and that's essential. So all the technological changes are feeding to that. And they're not the goals. The goal is really to focus on the learner. Yeah. From teacher center to learner center. That was a very good answer. <laughs> I mean that. <clears throat> that's why I like it. <laughs> Especially when you, for me, when I talk to somebody who is in a position of authority and they give me an answer that aren't reasonable. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I meant that as a compliment, too. Really. Because uh, uh, I've talked to a number of people in authority in my life, and as they rise up, they go down in my estimation. And uh, I couldn't go down because we met today. It sounds like I'm interviewing you. Why don't you ask me a question? Yeah, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, in your characterization of your approach to them, how would you look at it? We talked a little bit indirectly about it together. But as a learner, for instance, how would you approach new knowledge? How do you approach, you know, knowledge that is completely foreign to it? How do you go about the process of discovery? Um, that's, that's, that's a good question. As some of you know, I've done a lot of books, and they're on different subjects. And each book I approach, and each, and they have some gravitas to some of the books. Uh, some I don't like some more so much anymore, and they're sort of lightweight. But some of them are decent. And each one of them are on a subject that I approached because I didn't understand the subject. And I approached it that I, the, the book would be my journey from not knowing to knowing. But if I already knew about a subject, why should I do a book on it? Why should I build on expertise? I should build on my ignorance. That's basically what I have for sale, is my ignorance. That, uh, that I am, uh, and I know that's counterintuitive in a way, but it's, that's, it's my innocence. Um, I know I don't seem innocent, but I am. Uh, it's my innocence and, and lack of ability that, uh, that drives me to try to explain things so that I can understand them in a subject that interests me, even if it's very, even if it's quite vulnerable. So one of the books I've done that I really like, and it's maybe of the 80-some books I like, maybe half a dozen. So this is one of that small group. Uh, it's called Understanding Healthcare. It's a very, it's, it's a very dense book on, on healthcare. And I did it because, and I had no doctors involved uh, until it was completely finished. 
and they just checked it to see if it was okay. And uh, it was sponsored by two vulnerable companies, United Healthcare and J&J, &J, who never saw the book or the table of contents, and there's none of their products in it or no mention of it. So it wasn't an advertisement. And they gave me a considerable amount of money. Um, well, what I thought was a considerable amount of money. Um, and that journey is interesting to me. It, to me, it's the, the purity of these journeys, of these, they really are like, I, I did 22 guidebooks to cities. I, I wanted it, I did the guidebooks to learn about the city, not because I was an expert on the city. The first one was on LA, I moved there and couldn't find my way around, I couldn't find a guidebook to help me, so I did a guidebook. Uh, I did a road atlas to America because I, I know <coughs> in the road atlas that you get, the states are, in, are located in the book alphabetically and you don't drive across the United States alphabetically. <laughs> and it's really that dumb a thing. I mean, I'm that dumb. And, and so I did a road atlas to the United States that was not organized. It was, it, was how you, it, was, it had to do with human beings. It was what you can drive in a day, which is 250 miles. It was that every, the, the maps had squares, 50 mile squares, which are an hour square. Because you can drive about 50 miles in an hour if you square. Everything was oriented to me. So I would reduce my terror. So, so that's how I start a project. If some subject interests me, I'll do a book. So you see, you start with ignorance. Absolutely. And then, and then you reach knowledge, you reach, and then others, for instance, in this process, want them to write books based on their knowledge and their expertise. Right. So, you see, even the act of writing a book, you know, is different between you and somebody who starts with, a, with her expertise. Right. So, that's good. That's good. We're not uniform. We don't all fit within, within one box. Let me mention something else, Richard. <coughs> you mentioned to me that the more you talk about people with authority, the less respect you have to for them. That means that you gave yourself. I didn't say it just that way. Oh, well, well, it's something. So. I, okay. So how did you say? It? I didn't say it just that way. I meant that that way. But I didn't say <laughs> okay. <that. laughs> okay. Well, but by so doing, you gave yourself authority. So you became, you became a person of authority. So. That's the conundrum, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> So shall I interview you or shall you interview me? I'm ready to interview you. No, we can do it both, both ways. ways. Both ways. Right? Both ways. Yeah. So shall I continue? One more than me. Okay. <laughs> One more. One more. So you know, you have been thinking about ideas. And I, as you told me, I like ideas that are of interest to me because I'm discovering things through them. You generate many ideas, more than, you know, you can take into reality, mm -hmm. make them reality. Mm -hmm. And if you look back at the ideas that you built over the years, which ones didn't work as well? And, and what is the constant? Is there a constant between them? I think everything I do is lousy. Uh, I see pieces of things that I've done that make sense. But I, I'm disappointed with all my work. And why? It's never good enough. And it makes good enough for you. Who else is there? OK, so for instance, take, take something take that, you, that you think is close to perfection, but it's not there. Nothing is close to perfection. No, no. So what would you do differently today? Take the same project well, that's what, differently. I mean, when I, when I'm experimenting, I know there's not the best of anything. Uh, when I did a, a meeting uh, last fall, I, as an experiment, I thought, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal, I think today, about, well, it might have been, all, might have been the New York Times, I read it both, so I don't know which one, uh, about the overuse of the word innovation. And uh, I've been speaking about that lately, so it caught my attention that they had a whole article about that. And I, I find driving into San Francisco, is a sign, welcome to the innovation city. And then a car says they're an innovative car because they have a rear-facing camera so you can see who you run over. Or you have, uh, some, everything is innovative. So the, the, the story was about a cookie that came out with peanut butter in it. They called it an innovative 
cookie or something. That's what the article was about. That innovation is, in, everything is innovation, right? And I thought, no, it isn't innovation. There's, so I tried to come up with what I thought were the rules of innovation, what made for innovation. I came up with an acronym called the NOSE. Addition, so uh, my smartphone is an addition of different things. The iPhone is an addition. The car is an addition. It was a four-wheel vehicle. It was pulled by a horse. They added a motor. They added things. They added things together. And need. Need is a reason for innovation. Um, o, you do things the opposite way. It's often innovation, but just the opposite of things. Uh, Mr. Chow, the restaurateur, said, can you tell me something that's the truth? The opposite is truthier. <laughs> I love the word truthier. Uh, and then S is subtraction. And I'll go back to that one. And E is epiphany, just thinking of things. I'll go back to that one. But let me go to subtraction. So I thought I would look at whatever meetings I've done. I'm interested in gatherings, obviously. I've done a whole bunch of different ones. And I thought, well, the first TED, I subtracted uh, white men in suits on panels talking to each other about a single subject. I subtracted the, 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 uh, the lectern. Uh, I subtracted the, the uh, golf course. I subtracted uh, the things that conferences were always made up of long introductions. I didn't like being introduced. Yeah. I would prefer not being introduced. Um, I subtracted very long speeches, although I now give some very long speeches myself. Um, but I subtracted different things. And it turned out to be innovative, just by taking away things. Like the Bauhaus movement was an art <coughs> movement, which they took away things, they subtracted things. So I did a conference where I then took away presentations. So there was no screen. And uh, the, the speakers on the stage just faced, didn't face the audience, they faced each other like this. And they, they, were, they couldn't show a book, and they weren't introduced. And they didn't know how long they were going to talk until I said, OK, that's enough, and we got two more people. And it was the best conference I have ever run, and the best one I've ever been at. Uh, that wasn't bad, but now I did that. I wouldn't want to do it again. And why don't you want to do it again? Why do something you know how to do? No, but if this moment is interesting. No, no, it's interesting. Not for you. But it was just interesting But when, when you see that this could be scaled up and for others, is, are you? I don't copyright my books. Yeah, and so let's take, for instance, you're very proud of the fact that you started that, the TED box. Yeah. And you told me I'm frustrated with everything I do. It's, so if you have to redo it today, how would you do it differently? I wouldn't even go there. I would, I'm doing another conference, which is going to be about five years in the future, you know. Is it because years. you did it? Uh, yeah, or, did and you're bored with it? Or oh, because yes, yes. the, for, the uh, format doesn't fit? No, it's just it's not interesting to do something I've already done. No, that's so different. It's, so it's not a failure. Well, it's, it's boring. boring. It's boring. It's boring. Everything okay. is so boring. The repetition is boring. That's well, what you're doing saying. things you know how to do is boring. And trying to improve what you've done is boring. I mean, and what you want to do is something which is terrifying because you don't know how to do it. Well, why, that's the only interesting thing is for me to do something I don't know how to do. Good. How, how often do you change the way you dress, your look? Because it's boring if you dress in the same way at the same time every time. See, he's making fun of me. But I'm not making no, no, fun of no, you. A very short time ago, I shaved my head and I wore it that way for a while. I haven't been to a barber since I had been 19 when I took a deep set of tests and it said one of the things that all my, I took a two day testing thing because my father thought I shouldn't just go to art school. And uh, it turned out that, uh, that uh, archaeology, Architecture and hairdressing were the three things I did. <laughs> and I've never, I haven't, and now my hair is, is, I know this is eccentric, my hair now. And I'm going to cut it. I started cutting it the other day. It was long back here, and I started cutting it the other day. If I had been to a bar, and I don't, I don't even have scissors that are scissors for barbers. Scissors. I don't have a mirror. I do it by feel. I, I think so I changed the way I look. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think also, you know, it's... Uh, I took off weight. I took off 95 pounds four years ago. In the day. Why, why are you applauding? Yeah, I don't know why you're applauding. Why are you applauding? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was, you know, morbidly obese. That's the term for being that much overweight. So taking it off is just sensible. 
It's not to be applauded. And I took it off by eating less, not because of medical reasons. I make decisions, I do them. So I do change. I just, I do change. Good. What's your hobby when you were a kid? Your favorite hobby? To listen to people. I was always fascinated with this, you know, listening to people because, you know, that was a great way for me to learn. Because no one speaks in the same way. And, you know, growing in a multilingual environment allowed me also to be interested in, in language, and that's why I have been in, uh, in English. Do you think in English or do you think in another language? I don't think at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very interesting because, you know, now it's uh, predominantly English, but it, if you can't, you know, there are sometimes, uh, you know, with my wife, for instance, I speak French, uh, and uh, if I want a secret language uh, for my kids, I, I go in a different dimension. So it depends on the context. You don't limit yourself. When you, when you speak many languages, it's an opportunity for you to uh, be in different contexts and use different languages. So I don't, I try to, it's like, uh, you know, working out every day. You work out in different languages. <coughs> he really does listen, by the way, and I, I, I don't meet many people who listen. I listen to every word people say, and I found that when I met with him before I came here in this office, I couldn't slip anything past him. He really did listen to what I said word by word. And I commend him on that. And I suggested to people in the audience that you slow down your thinking process a little bit and listen to every word that people say. And you'll find it fascinating. And you'll find things about the words they say to be points of contact to have much deeper and more thoughtful conversations with them. I've been given the signal that I'm supposed to ask for questions. Now, I will tell you my prejudice about that to begin with. I think most questions are either speeches or bad questions. <laughs> but I've been told, and I've agreed to, that for you, uh, that uh, we will both take uh, 15 minutes of questions or until it's just unbearable. <laughs> For example, <laughs> <comes first. laughs> so address them to either uh, either one of us or both of them and uh, and then speak up when you say, yes ma'am, sir, sir, ma'am, I can't see, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> okay, I, I took my glasses off but I literally can't see. Right. Right. Um, I hope this is a bearable question, but you mentioned... Make them loud so everybody can hear. You mentioned the importance of memory. And that one of the greatest fears that you've noticed is the loss of memory as we get older. What are your thoughts on the idea of collective memory as being something that can sustain just not necessarily an individual state of mind, but a whole people's state of mind? So um, the French historian Pierre Nova came up with the idea of collective memory and said that it's a way to sort of sustain a society's ideals and views on something. How does that incorporate into the learner and educator? Uh, well, I think our, I, I'm probably not academic enough to answer that. To me, collective memory is, is, our, is our books now, and hopefully what will maintain online and not disintegrate. And uh, so that is our collective memory, which is growing at an exponential rate. Now, there's m much conversation lately about big data, which is sort of part of our collective memory. And my, my look at that is the filter of big data to get big understanding. And bigness is not, or more memory is not necessarily to be better. I think each of my electronic devices, which I always buy with the biggest memory I can because I don't want to feel like a wimp, <laughs> and of course, I don't use it. It would be like giving Michelangelo a bigger hammer to do to do to carve uh, Michelangelo. More isn't so interesting. To me. More people in an audience isn't interesting to me. Uh, what's interesting to me is better. 
uh, and filters. But somehow, the self-fulfilling prophecy of what lasts in, in our in our literature and now electronically and what maintains, although we lose something and we burn up a library in Alexandria or something like that, there's still is some filter of what lasts uh, in, in the uh, memory. You know, a library is memory and imagination. You know, it's interesting. First of all, it's a great question. Yes, good question. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to look at the world cultures, cultures that don't have any written tradition because they have a collective memory. And that's clear. That has been studied, documented, etc. So the collective memory cannot be reduced to books, cannot be reduced to big data, by definition, in an oral tradition. And collective memory, every tribe, every nation, every culture is based on collective memory. So, you know, he coined the notion of collective memory, but clearly, you know, he was lucky in coining that. But this is something that you see everywhere. That's what brings us together. You know, after the game, the hockey game, you know, and students, faculty, staff, we all they go there and we cheer, and that will stay as a part of a collective memory of being part of this university 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Collective memories are really there, but no one codifies collective memory. And that's very interesting. No one can codify, no one has the authority to codify them. And all the stuff about big data, etc., that's not memory. That exceeds memory, as you said, by definition. So the anxiety that you have about losing memory is losing first your identity. But secondly, you're losing also your collective memory. Namely, you're losing the fact that you belong to a tribe, or a culture, or a nation, or society. Sir? Uh, I had a question about the TED website. I noticed that there were three I don't videos. know TED anymore. Oh. Well, I was wondering if you knew there were three videos that were taken off the website, and I was wondering if you knew about I know of that. I'm not going to comment on that, because I don't own TED anymore. So this has a policy. I'm sorry. Yes? Uh, this is more for President Aoun. Uh, I was wondering, what do you think is the role of a teacher in a learning-centered environment? Okay, you want to answer that first? No? He is the you. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. But maybe you want to start first. No. Okay. <laughs> the, me the metaphor is the metaphor of a coach. Or cabinets. The coach doesn't play ball. You know, if you look at it, the coach plays ball less well at her stage or his stage than the players themselves. So essentially, you know, we as teachers are presenting you with opportunities are questioning you and we want you to question us. But we are not giving you the knowledge. You don't need us to for this knowledge. And the knowledge is also not unidirectional between you and me, where you give me and I give you, but also this peer environment, the team. So if you look at it, and if you try to create a diagram, goes in all directions. So the role of the teacher is to raise questions, opportunities to challenge you, but also for you to challenge them. And, the, and once again, you'll have your colleagues doing that too. So if I come and I say I have the knowledge, you don't need me for that. Switch on any computer, and you get it. It's more this didactic of questioning each other and questioning what we read. Why should we accept what we read as being the truth? You know, discoveries, innovations, whatever, happen when essentially you question uh, something that we all agree on. So 
but that's a beauty of the process. The, the best teaching, uh, one, one of the best, one of the two good teaching experiences I had that I remember was I taught at Cambridge when I was fairly young, in the school, the school of Architecture at Cambridge, University and not Cambridge here, in England. And part of my duties was I had six students that I met with one hour every week and we just talked about anything. It was not, there was no classwork, there was no book they had to read, there was no uh, lesson they had. It was just a dialogue, individual personal dialogue for an hour with each of these five or six students. They chose me and you and you did that. And that's the British system. Yes. Let me tell you, I find enormous limitations with the system. Because this is based on the idea that, that look, we are all now looking at an issue from multiple perspectives and multiple disciplines. That's why when I need to think about an issue, I want to be with an economist, I want to be with a scientist, I want to be there with an engineer, I want to be with a philosopher, I want to be with an architect, when I think about urban issues. In the British system, the one-on-one -on -one is a great start, but not a great end. I think it's the duty for you to guide them to all those people but also in a it, very personal way. But more than guiding, is essentially we all have, each discipline has a different uh, language. You know, different words, different uh, nomenclature, different, you know, uh, so that you don't understand, you know, what I am talking about in my field, and I don't understand what he's talking about in his field of engineering, etc. And then the whole idea is that when you bring people from different disciplines, often, you know, we will, you know, you talk to various uh, uh, colleagues uh, look, doing multidisciplinary work, mm -hmm. is that they spend a lot of time learning each other's languages. Because that's a value. It became a value because we, when we created specialties, we, you know, we created a set of words that are esoteric. Mm -hmm. and shamans, then, you create a lot of shamans. Yeah, I mean, and so, but, that, but those words have meaning and those words have implications. So going beyond that, you know, is with the beauty of, the, of putting yourself in a multidisciplinary work in the British system and you are one with the other. The teacher, you back to the idea that the teacher has a central law and you guide. And, you know, take, take for instance what, what we have here uh, in, in, you know, in those multidisciplinary centers. The, the, you know, the, the students involved with those, doing their research, doing their discoveries, are, are you know, looking at their own path, as creating their own path, their own journey. You know, ultimately, the success, going back to your question, the success for me as a teacher is when I disappear. And when you are ahead of me. That's how I would quantify my success. But that's why no permission, no guidance. I'll have a sidebar with you in the end, because I'll tell you what I had students do was to tell me what they had expertise in that I didn't understand. And the discussion was then of trying to make me understand cricket, to explain something to me. And that was the exercise. Not from my expertise, but from there to explain what they do. Yeah, I mean, that, that is works when you are trying to understand something that is very established and finite. But the whole process of learning is to discover the unknown. I know not only for you, but maybe because it's unknown as a field. And that's the beauty of the learning process. You see, you know, when we tell our students you have the opportunity to, you know, to be involved in knowledge discovery, they are creating knowledge. And creating knowledge means that you start from the unknown and you don't know where you end up. That's fascinating. It's great. Well, you know, I agree with that. Absolutely. I wasn't lecturing you. No. Oh, okay. Not now. I did it before. Yes. <laughs> Ma'am. Um, I am really interested on, uh, in the discussion you guys are having on um, 
listening because it's a, just a personal goal of mine to be a better listener. I feel like um, it's just mainly, you know, um, like do away with being described as like the talkative person. And because of that, um, I mean, going off of that, um, I think that there's kind of a habit in listening. I mean, a habit, sorry, a habit in talking um, where you, um, there's question. A, What's the question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, there, okay, I'll get through it. I'll get through it right now. There's a habit in, in, in being urgent um, when you're talking to someone, feeling like, um, geez, God, um, like when you're listening to someone and you feel like you can't wait to say what you want to say. And, I'm, and I am wondering what your personal opinion is on um, being able to get rid of that sense of urgency and really listen to the person without having your like personal that personal I think I got it. Do you know what I'm I think so. All right. I don't think you'll like my answer. But uh, it's the way I took off weight. I just decided to. I think you can decide certain things if you want to do them badly enough. Uh, and I think if you want to do what you say you want to do, if you want to train yourself or you feel it's valuable or experiment with listening more than you talk or realize you have two ears and one mouth, uh, you can make that decision and try it and see if you have that discipline. But I don't know what else I can tell you to do. I find, I talk a lot. At the same time, I like to really enjoy listening. Uh, I can listen to somebody <coughs> Sometimes in, in Brockman's uh, blog on, on the uh, internet, I can listen to somebody talk for an hour sometimes. Just sit there and watch it. That surprises me. You can't, by definition, I can't talk to my computer. I just have to listen to somebody, and I find that fascinating. And I find listening to the nuance of what somebody says fascinating. And my wife says I always interrupt her. <laughs> You just said something. I want to go back to what you said. I don't want people to say I'm talkative. You don't yield to pressure. You know, somebody is going to pressure you in some directions, and another person is going to pressure you in another direction. So if you, you spend your whole life feeling the pressure in this way, try to see how, you know, and that's a process that you are, you know, undertaking. And everyone of us undertakes the same process constantly. Who ultimately you want to be? Now, don't start with the social pressure. It's Could I just say you should take one more question just to keep sure. on schedule? You, 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 you. I'd love to hear your opinion. You've laid out, I think, a magnificent view of Where do you think, not, not Northeastern, but where do you think American higher education is in terms of this model that you've talked about, given all the enormous pressures that we now face in higher education, financial pressures, <coughs> pressures, <coughs> pressures and so forth. Have, are we near a golden age? Are we going to get to a golden age? Were we once in a golden age of higher education defined as learning as you have? Or what do we need to get there? <laughs> you know, Barry, you all know, we all know that we are in a period of tremendous change in higher education. And the tremendous change is coming from, for different reasons. And the golden age is yet to come, which means that either we decide to say we have it, we have the best formula, or we say, you know, being an institution of learning, we have to shape, we have to shape and reshape constantly. Question what we do, reshape it, and move to a different level, and look at it. And we don't change for the sake of change. You see, we are looking if we believe that really education is moving from a teacher-centered approach to a learner-centered approach, then 
the work that, we, that is being done on learning is key. Questioning our curricula constantly is key. Questioning of, you know, what does it mean to have a Northeastern education? We're constantly looking at that and asking ourselves, all together, the community, with the students, you know, we want to be global, we want to be entrepreneurial, we want to be multifaceted, we want to shape new knowledge as learners, etc. We, we don't live in a static environment. So, you know, that's a great opportunity. And if you look at it, higher education is a very conservative field. We're not conservative in creating new knowledge and discoveries that you work but we're conservative in the modes of transmission. What is interesting about here, and I really mean every word of that about Northeastern, is that Northeastern approaches learning from a different perspective. We didn't follow the you know other universities. We set our own path. We said in order to learn, you need to bring together this experience that we have in a classroom setting with the world experience and integrate them together. But if you integrate them together, the world is changing. And therefore, the integration has to change. Let me tell you, when, when I teach linguistics, I want every student learning this linguistics to take 600 courses. I'll be happy. Why? Because essentially I'm trying to clone myself. <laughs> but the question becomes, forget about me. You know, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What is it that the learner wants? When do we achieve that somebody knows economics, knows about urban? By stacking more and more courses? No. So traditionally what we have done is we stack those courses, and if you look at curricula in higher education, they are like geological strata. You know, at some point, some of us came and said, okay, we need that in the curriculum. Somebody else came and said, after us, or with, with us, or they said, no, let's add more. So in the 80s, we had that. In the 90s, we had that. In the, you know, 2000, and that, we keep proliferating. And so the question becomes, what is it? that we need to learn when we say, we, we, we learn physics. We I have a major in physics, for instance. So we, we question constantly our, in our research the conventional wisdom. And we do it also in our practices, in how we transmit this knowledge. I'll do one minute, and I know that'll be the conclusion of this. Um, this is just a moment. We're just in a moment. There's no best way of doing anything. We can do as well as we can at the moment. We can even, as an operative, we can learn at some time that all life comes from photosynthesis, only to find out that that's completely wrong. And we, at that next moment, we do something else. We can learn that the smallest particle is the atom, and then learn that there are many, 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 many subatomic particles. So that what we had just learned as an operative is wrong. And we go on from that. And we're just in a, we have somehow, there's an arrogance about the importance of, of, of this moment. Everything is changing constantly. There's not going to be Twitter sometime very soon. There's not going to be Facebook sometime very soon. Everything is going to go. But that's okay. In fact, that's really exciting. I don't, all my books are going out of print. I don't reprint any book. I want no legacy. I just want things to go on and people to have some interesting days. <laughs> we are made up of, they approximately, they say we have a trillion 
seven. Nine hundred billion of those cells are supposed to be one are other creatures. They're not human cells. We are not human beings, we're zoos. <laughs> Nothing has a has a permanence or we should we be arrogant about. We should just have interesting things and do interesting things and listen as well as we can and question, question, question and have good conversations with enormously wonderful people. And I've enjoyed tonight very much. Enjoy.